In this video, we're going to conduct a one sample test of proportions. For this first example, it says the statistical abstract reported that 17% of adults attended a musical play in the past year. To test the claim, a researcher surveyed 90 people and found that 22 had attended a play in the past year. At the 0.05 significance level, test, that the claim, um, test the claim that this figure is correct. So as we pull out some of the information, this 0 0.05, our significance level is alpha, so alpha equals 0 0.05. 17%, um, that's going to be our hypothesized percentage, so we're going to call that P. So P is 0.17 or 17%. For our sample, we had um, 90 people surveyed, so N is equal to 90. And the amount of people that said they had attended to play is going to be our X, kind of like our number of successes, which is 22. So when I put the N and the X together, that gives me P hat, which is my sample percentage or sample proportion. This is going to be X over N, 22 over 90. And I can either leave it as a fraction, but I think it's going to be easier to work with that as a decimal. So 22 divided by 90 gives me um, 0.244 repeating. So let's call that about 0.244. I'll save one decimal place beyond the one I was given. So as I put this together, I need to start with my hypotheses. Null hypothesis and alternative hypothesis. Um, let's see, it says that um, we're reporting 17%. And the question at the bottom just says, is the figure correct? Well, it either is or it isn't. So I'm going to say that P equals 0.17 for my null. So automatically, my alternative hypothesis is not equals 0.17. This gives me a two-tail test. So if I sketch my normal curve, I've got a two-tail test. 0.17 is right here in the middle. I have a rejection region in the left tail and a rejection region in the right tail. So that's what it looks like. What I want to figure out is where 0.244 lies. So it's 0.244 over here, which would be in my fail to reject region, or is it over here in my rejection region? So I've got a fail to reject region in the middle and the two rejection regions on either end because of our two-tail test. Well, to continue on, I need to do two things. I'm using the traditional method, so I'm going to convert everything into z-scores. I need to figure out what my critical z-scores are, and those are the ones that cut off my rejection regions. So to find my critical z-score, there's a couple things I can do. Um, I'm going to go ahead and use the table F that came with our textbook. And if I go to table F, uh, let's see, so here it is. So if I go to table F, I have a two-tail test. My significance level is 0 0.05, and I'm looking for a Z-score. I had 90 people, so I don't need to worry about a T-score. So I go all the way to the bottom, and I find that that is at the very bottom of my um, table, which is hard to see on the video. But at the very bottom of the table, that's 1.96. So we can say that our critical value, there are two of them, it's either negative or positive, 1.96, 1.96. The other way to figure that out is to use the inverse norm function on the calculator. The inverse norm takes an area from the left on the normal curve. Well, as I'm checking this normal curve out and comparing it with my significance level, 0 0.05, this is the total area of the rejection region. This is my total area. But it got divided into two sections. So I need to divide that area by 2. So 0 0.05 divided by 2 is 0 0.025. So my areas are 0 0.025 on both sides. Inverse norm takes an area from the left. So in my calculator, I'm going to ask it for the inverse norm of 0 0.025. Okay, here's my calculator. Let me clear what I've got. I'm going to go into the distribution menu that. Go into the distribution menu, so second distribution menu, down to inverse norm. Area from the left is the area of that left tail, which is 0 0.025, and there it is. There's my z-score, negative 1.9, if I round it, negative 1.96, so either method. 
So what we have now are the critical z-scores that cut off the rejection region. I'm going to put a plus or minus here. So plus or minus. I need to figure out the z-score for 0.244. That's going to be my test value. So I'm going to find my test value, which is the z-score for 0.244. In order to do that, I need the z-score formula for chapter 8. And I'm just looking at my formula card here. The z-score formula for chapter 8, z-test for a proportion. So here's my formula card. I'm going to rewrite this because it's hard to see, but I'm going to use this one right here. So the z-test for a proportion, I've got p hat minus p over that square root of pq over n. So let me put that here. I'm going to use um, p hat, which is my sample p, minus p, divided by the square root of pq over n. I've got all the information except q. So as I go up here and figure out what my p and my q and my p hat are, I've got p is here. Well, if p is 0.17, that means that q is 1 minus 0.17. And that tells me that q is 0.83. So I've got p, I've got q, and I've got the p hat, which, which is my test proportion or test percentage. Okay, so I'm going to use the 0.17, the 0.83, the 0.244, and remember that n was equal to 90. So my z-score for 0.244 is, let's put parentheses here, 0.244 minus the hypothesized percentage, which is 0.17, divided by the square root of parentheses p times q, so 0.17 times q, which is 0.83, divided by n, which is 90. So I'll put that into my calculator, um, just like I've got there, including parentheses and everything, divided by the square root of 0.17 times 0.83, divided by 90. And we get... Uh, let's see, what do I have? Two decimal places here, so I'll round this also to two decimal places. We get, oh, let me, let's see, I had an error there, so 0.17, I put a 0.19, let me fix it, 0.17. Okay, so we get 1.868, so how about 1.87 if I round that? So there's my z-score, my test value, my test value of 1.87, if I put it up here under my, under my normal curve, it's going to land about there. Yeah, I'm exaggerating probably, but anyway, it's not going to land in my rejection region. It's smaller than my critical value, so I'm landing in my fail to reject region, which tells me that my test percentage of about 24.4% is close enough to 17%. I did not demonstrate a significantly bigger or a significantly different percentage with my sample. So my conclusion, so I'm ready for my decision or my conclusion, based off my picture here, I got a 50-50 chance. I either fail to reject the null hypothesis or I reject the null hypothesis. I was not significantly bigger, so my um, decision is fail to reject. The null hypothesis. Our very last step is to summarize, which really means you're going to go up and answer the original question. If I go back up to the problem, it says, test the claim that the figure is correct. We found that our percentage was close enough to the given figure of 0.17. So we're going to claim that it's correct. So we couldn't show otherwise. And so we're just going to say, figure appears to be correct. And what we might do, if we still don't think it is correct, is maybe go gather some more data. Go um, increase our sample size, uh, make sure we have good sampling techniques, and so on and so forth, to make sure that we've got a good um, sample. So we've got our five steps here. I didn't number them, but you certainly could. So we've got our um, hypothesis, hypotheses. We have our critical value, number two. Um, our test value, number three. Our decision based on the normal curve, which was either fail to reject or reject. 
so that was number four. And then finally, we interpreted those results, number five. Okay, I've got one more example here, so let's pull this one off. Here's our next example. We'll do the same five steps. Well, almost. So let's take a look at what this one says. This one says the Energy Information Administration reported that 51.4% of homes in the U.S. were heated by natural gas. A random sample of 200 found that 115 were heated by natural gas. Does the evidence support the claim, or has the percentage changed? Notice that word changed. It doesn't say increased or decreased. It just says changed. So I'm expecting equals and not equals for my hypotheses. Um, again, we have a 0 0.05 significance level. That's my alpha. And as I put the rest of the information together, 51.7 is what we got from this um, energy administration. My sample is the 200 and 115. So P is 0 0.517. Uh, let's see, that 200 was the number sampled, so N is 200. We found uh, 115, so that's X. I put those two together for P hat. So P hat is X divided by N, which is 115 divided by 200. And we get 0.575. So that was 115 over 200. Um, and I think we're ready to go. Note, though, that it says use the P value method. The graphing calculator uses the p-value method, so I am going to take advantage of that and do this particular hypothesis test using my um, TI-83, or TI-84. But I need to put my hypotheses together. Null hypothesis. Let's see, it either has changed or it hasn't from the 51.7. So for the null, p equals 0.517, and the alternative, p does not equal 0.517. So this, again, is a two-tail test. I'm significantly different on the left or on the right. If I'm labeling this with my percentages or proportions, my expected value goes here. And I want to figure out where 0.575 lies. It's bigger, but the question is, is it significantly bigger, which would put it over here? Or is it close enough, which would put it over here? Now, I've set up enough to do this using um, the calculator. What I want to find is the p-value. So as I take a look at this, my um, significance level is 0 0.05. I have two tails. So if I divide that by 2, I get 0 0.025 in either tail, 0 0.025 in either tail. When I find the p-value, I want to know if the p-value, which is the area cut off, the area cut off by my test value, which is my sample percent, 0.575. I want to know if this area fits neatly into these two tails, or if it spills out into um, the fail to reject region. So p-value is an area. And my significance level is an area. So with the p-value method, we're comparing areas. Okay, well, let's let the calculator do as much work as it can. Okay, so here's my calculator. I'm going to go to the stat menu and choose tests. We are doing a one sample proportion test. So I go down here to number five. So down to number five. And it asks me for some questions. So this P sub 0, this is the percentage from my hypothesis, which is here. So that's my population P, so that's 0.517. X is 115. N, 200. And the proportion, this is asking me for the alternative hypothesis, which is this guy. So I want it to be a not equals. So I'm going to hit Enter to select the not equals and I'm going to ask it to calculate. Okay, so here's what it gave me. It gave me, um, it said, oh, okay, your, null hy or your alternative hypothesis is this, and yes, it is. It gave me the test value. This is the z-score that we used in the traditional method. I don't need this, actually, for this method. But here's my p-value. It gave me 0 0.10. 
So that p value, and then it just confirms that I've got n here and then p hat there. My p value is 0 0.10. So remember, I'm comparing area. So let me pull this off. My p value is 0 0.10. So this would be the area. My alpha is my area in the rejection region. Regions, because I've got two, which is 0 0.05. 0 0.10 is bigger than 0 0.05. This p-value area does not fit into this area. So if I were to take my yellow pen and try and fit this 0 0.10, and I could split it up and say, okay, if I split it between two tails, I'd have 0 0.05 in each tail. Well, this is only 0 0.025, so my p-value area spills into my fail to reject region. The other way to think of that is it doesn't fit. It's too big. So what we have then is a test value 0.575 here that is not in the rejection region. So we then say, since my p-value area is bigger than the rejection area, we conclude that we fail to reject the null hypothesis. So again, my p-value area is bigger than the rejection region area. Doesn't fit in there. So we fail to reject. And then finally, our last step is to answer the question given. And it says, does the evidence support the claim, or has the percentage changed? We did not show a significant difference. Since my p-value area was bigger than the rejection region area, I am not significantly different. So has it changed? Um, no, we didn't show that it changed. So we'll say, um, we'll say no significant change. Or at least not one that we could show. So no significant change in the percentage. When you do your p-value, your, your book goes through and it explains how to do the p-value um, using a formula kind of by hand. You don't need to do that. Go ahead and use the p-value right out of the um, calculator. But you need to interpret that as an area. Does the p-value area fit inside the rejection region or not? So that's the question.